We're in a year called the year of one. We're one church with one mission, trying to reach one more for the one name that saves. And what we did at the very start of the year is put the name of our one on the wall. And on the wall, that's a person that we love greatly. We want to see them come into a love relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what those names are, those are representative of people who we love that we're praying for every time we come to church. A lot of times you sit in the same place, you're able to go, oh, that reminds me to pray for Susie. That reminds me to pray for Jerry, whatever that is. But here's where we're going to kind of segue. You can always do that till the end of the year. Think December 31st, we're going to paint those walls. But up until then, you can write the name of your one on there, or you can like me, you can cheat and put four. I've got four over here, but here's what I need you to do. We've had a number of people that have come to repentance and faith, surrendered the Lordship of Christ this year. And many of them are on the wall. So one of the things we do at our response time We have like music and scripture and then we study the word and then we have a little more music and that's our response time. And there's a bunch of different ways we can do that. Some people you'll see, they'll come up here and pray. They've got some burdens. They've got some things they need to give over to the Lord. Bunch of different reasons people come and pray. Some people will just simply sing and that's great too. Some people are like, oh, this is my time to kind of jump on the bandwagon and be a part of kind of the mission of God in regards to generosity. But also here's what I need you to do is if your one is on the wall and you've seen them surrender to Christ, if you would, either at the response time, any week you're in here, it would build people's faith and it would give glory to God if you would simply take the red felt markers that are in the baskets right by the wall and just simply circle their name. You don't need to put pictures, exclamation points, any of that stuff, just circle their name because what that does is it gives glory to God. The psalmist always talks about, listen, give testimony to God and for his great works. That's what it does. But also, it's going to build the faith of your brothers and sisters. Like, for example, I've got four over here on the wall. None of those four at this point, as I speak right now, that I know of, have surrendered to Christ. And so when I see you, having seen your one come to Christ, that's going to build my faith. And it's like the dad in the gospels is like, I do believe, help my unbelief. You could be a tool to helping me believe for my four. You got it? All right, so that's where we are. Um, as a matter of fact, let me say one last thing is uh, the last couple weeks being out, I'm trying to memorize Psalm 16. If you're looking for something to memorize, it's not super long. I think it's 11 verses. I've got a ways to go. But Psalm 16, verse three, reminded me of you. Because I thought, especially this last week, or really the week before that, I was like, man, I, I love you guys. You're like, you don't even know me. Uh, you, I, and I want to know you. Yeah, I'd love to have you introduce yourself, but I love you. I love the Jesus in you. I love the way God uses you. I don't think a week goes by, sometimes not even a day goes by, where I don't hear how God is using you. Built more church uh, in Western North Carolina and beyond. And so um, here's some of the stories, just briefly. I just I flipped open a file, read through a few of them. Here's just a few of the stories that I've heard pretty recently. There's a there's a teen girl uh, up in uh, Franklin at the Franklin campus, and she quote life was not worth living. She was taking steps toward that. And then the students at the Franklin campus shared the gospel with her. God did what God does and he saved her. And now, and then she got baptized. And then also after they say, you can't even, you can barely tell that's the same girl. She went from somebody with deep despair, deep depression, and now has got the joy of the Lord. Another one, here's a testimony that a man wrote me. He's a businessman. He's probably about my age. He said, you know what? I've been chasing the almighty dollar for years. I started in Chicago. Then I went to Arizona. Then we figured out we can live anywhere we want to. And they figured out Asheville's one of the top places people want to live. Then they sent there, started to watch the church online. He said, everywhere we went from the Blue Ridge Parkway to the hiking trails to the grocery store to where, to the schools we were looking at, all I found is like all these Biltmore members, all these Biltmore members are coming up there. They were introducing themselves. They were inviting us to church, et cetera, et cetera. We started watching online and then we finally decided to show up on site one day. And it said, we've showed up out in the parking lot and it says the Barnes family, that's one of the, some of the people that work in our reception area out there. They saw us and the way they greeted us in the parking lot just smoothed the way the whole way. And as we sat in, as we sat in church, and actually I talked to the Barnes uh, after the first service. And I said, I said, hey, this is this great story from Vic. And said, well, actually, they sat right behind us in service. Well, Vic said, you know, I surrendered my life to Christ a few weeks later at the Good Friday service. Then another one, you got, uh, there's another person like, hey, our unchurched parent was coming into town. I love this one. 
unchurched parent was coming into town for a, a birthday. We invited them to church, but we knew they didn't believe in Christ and they didn't want to come. They said, hey, you know what? We have an outdoor seating area, that place with the fire pits and stuff. We have an outdoor seating area. So guess what? It's supposed to be a beautiful day. You can come to church with us. We're going to go into church. You can sit out there and drink your coffee. Well, it shows up at church and it starts to pour down rain. So he can't sit out there. He can't sit out there. In the, and so he comes in here and it's like, man, God just got, got a hold of him. And he's now saying, you know what, man? Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. So listen, I mean, God, you know, even for a Baptist, God can use, uh, God can use the rain. And then lastly, uh, 36 year old man, he said, I moved to Western North Carolina for, uh, uh, to get clean. Uh, I visited your church. One of your pastors called me, led me to Christ on the phone. He said, I've been sober for 118 straight days. So again, here's my point. My point is this. Listen, church, I love you. I love the way God is using it. This is our church. It's not my church. Jesus is like the chief shepherd, all right? He's the senior pastor of the church. I get to be the part of kind of the mouthpiece a lot of times. But listen, this is your church as well. So great job. Love you. Love doing life with you. Now, if you've been here all summer long, we've been in a series called One at a Time. Now, one at a time, we've been going through the gospel accounts. There's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And in these four gospels, you'll see different episodes where Jesus, the pattern of Jesus, oftentimes he would talk to big crowds, but oftentimes the scriptures would show that he would zero in on one person. Like there'd be a big crowd, but then he would zero in, kind of like a zoom lens does on your camera. It zooms in on the one person. He begins to talk to them. And so for the last about three months, we've been looking at a lot of the teachings Jesus does. Like it starts off and he's talking to John the Baptist and then John the Baptist actually baptizes Jesus. We talked about that. Then in the call of the disciples. And then you get into all those ones like his situation with Peter. You talk about the rich young ruler that Clayton did last week. Then you talk about Zacchaeus, the wee little man, all that kind of stuff. But I want to tell you, we're about to take a shift just like the gospels, they often slow down in the last week of Jesus's life. And so what we're going to do next week and the following couple of weeks after that, as we finish up this series is next week. And the two weeks after that are going to be about the res- some of the resurrection appearances. You know, we're going to do it. It doesn't even have to be Easter. We're going to look at some of those resurrection appearances. But today it's kind of like we say around Easter, it's like you can't celebrate at the empty tomb until you mourn, until you go and you see the brutality of the cross. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the cross. Primarily, we're going to look at a conversation he had with one man on a cross. It's not a big conversation. It's not a long conversation. He has a conversation with a man who says one thing. He basically asks for a favor. And amazingly, in one of the craziest answers to prayer, Jesus answers that prayer. And so when we look at this, here's a, here's a little Bible study hack. If you're new to Bible study, what you want to ask sometimes is when you read a narrative, who in the story am I? At the soul level, who am I in the story? And if I can't identify that, who do I want to be in the story? Because you're going to see in the story, in the story, everybody in this room, everybody watching online, everybody at all the camp, they are, you are one of two. It's like a microcosm of the human race. You're one of the two people in the story. So we're going to actually look at three crosses today. It all starts with the letter C. I kind of felt Baptist-y today. So it's like, we're going to look at, we're going to look at three crosses, all right? The first cross, they're all alliterated. So it's the, it's the cross of Christ. So Luke 23, let me walk you through this passage. Luke 23, verse 32, it says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his, on his left. The word criminal there means evildoer. It's a picture of somebody who was like an insurrectionist trying to overthrow Rome. It's like there was a group of insurrectionists in, the, in Judaism and they, they would kill people, they would riot, they would do all that, trying to, trying to take back what Rome had taken from them. As a matter of fact, some commentators, many commentators say that the cross that Jesus was eventually crucified on was actually originally made for a guy named Barabbas. Because at this point in time, here's the context. The context is there'd been the kangaroo court and the trial and the denial and all that kind of stuff. But there's a point leading up to this where there's a guy named Barabbas, same words are used to describe him as the two criminals that says, you know what, do you want Barabbas or do you want Jesus? And the crowd cries out, we want Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And even right there, there's a picture of why Jesus came. Jesus came 
to die in our place. I mean, can you imagine? Barabbas wakes up. He thinks this is going to be the last day of his life. He thinks by sundown he is going to be dead. But then a man he did not even know takes his place on the cross. And that evening he's talking to his friends, having supper with his friends, talking about the man, the man who took his place on the cross. That's the reason Jesus came. That's what's going on here. Now, sometimes it kind of puzzles us because like in this text, it simply says, and there they, and there they crucified him. It's a place called the skull. In Aramaic, it's called Golgotha. In Latin, it's called Calvary. But it says a place of a skull. Most people think it was like a stone place that maybe pictured a little bit, a skull picture. And when you look at that, it says the reason Jesus came it's, is in verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Now, as I was saying, many people go, why wasn't crucified described in the gospels. If you notice it, whether you be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it simply says very much like Luke does here, it simply says, and they crucified him. You're like, oh, why didn't he describe what goes on? And I'll give you two reasons. Number one is the original hearers of this text would have understood what crucifixion is. They'd seen it happen. There was a gladiator named Spartacus, as a matter of fact, who tried to rebel against Rome and to Give him an example to show that, listen, this is what happens to you when you try to rebel against Rome. They crucified Spartacus and 6,000 men along a 120-mile road to say, listen, don't do this. This is what will happen. But I think the second reason the Bible and the Gospels doesn't describe the way crucifixion plays itself out, and we get this from the history books, is because the Bible has already recorded the crucifixion scene 700, 800 years before Jesus was ever even born. If you've never read it, look at Psalm 22 sometime and you see a blow by blow description of the crucifixion of Christ, starting off with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Going through it, blow by blow, detail by detail, even on who is going to be around the cross when he's crucified, to the where he's gonna be buried, how he's gonna be buried, and even how the mission gets out. And so when you look at a text like this, you got to understand what crucifixion, until Mel Gibson's uh, movie, The Passion of the Christ, came out, most of us had a sanitized version of what crucifixion was. And he probably had the most apt description. Whether you know it or not, the, you know, what, what scene you saw, most crucifixion historians say we're not uh, way up high on a, on a cross like most pictures are. Most of them aren't 10 feet. 10 feet up in the air. Most of the time they would crucify people. They would crucify them like one or two feet off the ground so that the bystanders could come by and mock them and spit at them. And the person being crucified could smell what freedom looks like to the people all around them and say, this is your lot. And they wouldn't do it on some hill far, far away. They would do it at the busiest place they could to show the people again, don't rebel against Rome or this is what awaits you. And so they crucified Jesus, and you see this in verse 35, and the people stood by watching. The rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. If you're unfamiliar with Christ, Christ is not Jesus' last name. H is not his middle name. It's, it's Christ is his title. It's who he was. It was, for the Jews, it was their long-awaited deliverer, their long-awaited rescuer, the one that was prophesied in over and over and over again, but that it kind of developed into a political kind of superhero that was going to come and kick the Romans out and kick the Jews in. And it's like, this is the, this is the Christ, the chosen one. But the soldiers, they also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine, saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews, which that's what they would do. That was sort of like, this is the charge against them. And actually, they were actually saying the truth. They were telling the truth, thinking they were making an accusation. Now, I want you to think about this. Sometimes people in our day and time, we think the cross has always been the symbol of the Christian faith. And for about 300 years, it wasn't. There was a bunch of different symbols. John Stott, in his book called The Cross of Christ, he talks about the different symbols that were at least initially looked at to be a symbol of Christianity. He said the first one was what's called an ichthus. Ichthus is like, some of y'all have it on your cars, maybe it's like the fish. All right, it's called an ichthus because it's an acronym calling Jesus, Son of God, Savior. And it's like they would come up to people, somebody would make one slash, the other one would make the other slash saying, I'm also a believer. So that was there for a little bit of a time. 
Then they went to things they said it could have been, it could have been it. It could have been an, almost like a, a servant's apron, picturing the way that Jesus served the disciples and washed their feet, but it wasn't that. Could have been a stone, picturing obviously the resurrection, the empty tomb. I mean, the cornerstone of the faith. It could have been, could have been that. Some of them said it could have been a boat, which is kind of like the teaching ministry of Jesus. He would sometime get in a boat, push off from shore, and it was the teaching ministry, all the amazing stories and parables and teaching that he would do. And he goes over this, over this. He said it could have been all these things. It could have been a manger, the fact that Jesus became a man, that God incarnate, Jesus in a manger. It could have been any of those things, he said. But He said it was a cross, and he said the reason was the whole Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, was about the cross, the person and the work of Jesus. Now, next week, in a post-resurrection appearance, we're actually going to look at how did Jesus teach the Bible? How did he teach the Bible? But one of the things you're going to know about Bible study is the New Testament quotes the Old Testament all the time. Every Old Testament book 39 of them, every one of them except five. So 34 out of the 39 Old Testament books are quoted somewhere by the New Testament authors. Jesus himself quotes out of 24 different Old Testament books. So here's what I want you to understand. Is the Old Testament is like the picture book of the gospel. It's like the picture book. All throughout it, there are these pictures of the person and work of Jesus, what he's doing right here in this text. I mean, Adam and Eve, he says, listen, there's gonna be a serpent crusher soon. Jesus is actually being crucified during Passover, which happened in the book of Exodus. You got Noah. Noah's like, I'm gonna build an ark so that humankind can be saved. Jesus is like the greater ark to save mankind. You got Abraham. I mean, Abraham, Abraham, Father Abraham. I mean, Abraham is supposed to go out and sacrifice his son Isaac. And on the way there, God provides a ram that gets caught in a thicket. Hey, deer hunters, hunters, have you ever been like walking to your stand? And then like, oh, look at there. There's a 10 point that's like caught in a bush just for me. You would say that is a miracle. Never seen that. Never ever seen that. And yet God has a ram gets caught in a thicket to show that, listen, there's going to be a day when my son, it's the same mountain, same mountain that Jesus is now being crucified on. You go on, you got the sacrificial system, the prophecies, John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God. Here's the part that I want you to understand. I think Luther put it great. Martin Luther, Martin Luther was like, in the, he was the head of the Protestant Reformation, or at least the instrument that started it, that kind of kicked it off. And he said this, Luther said, all the prophets foresaw that on the cross, Jesus became the greatest murderer, adulterer, thief, rebel, and blasphemer that there ever was. Our most merciful father sent his only son into the world and said to him, Jesus, you will become Peter the denier. You will become Paul the persecutor, blasphemer, and cruel oppressor. You will become David the adulterer. You will become Adam the sinner, which did take the fruit in the garden. So understand, Jesus is not just dying for us. He is dying instead of us. He's dying instead of us. Now, here's the reason that we've got to drill down on this. You're like, man, most of us in this room, we're believers, Church, I believe this with all my heart. I mean, I believe it, I preach it, I dive into it. I'm staking my whole life on this story, but I still have a tendency to get up every morning and forget it. I still have a tendency to get fired up on Sunday and like, let's charge hell with a water pistol. But then the shiny things of this world by Wednesday start to kind of lead me to forget about it. That's why one gospel writer said, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. Now, some of you might be in here and you're like, I can't. It's like we're in the, you're still in a vestige of a Bible belt. And you might've grown up with somehow you got the idea that, man, before I come to God or before I go to church, I got to kind of get my act together. I got to clean myself up. I got to like go right and sober and proper and so forth. That's crazy. That's crazy. You don't go, I'm going to get healthy before I go to a hospital. You don't do that. You're like, well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know how long I've been gone. I mean, who do you think you are to think that you can actually out the grace and the blood of Jesus? I mean, you got to be like, man, I, you can't out the grace of Jesus. And so what you do is you come to Jesus and let him clean you, let him clean you up. You're like, how do you even know that? You're going to see a brother here in about five minutes. All this guy does He's got five minutes left to live. And he comes and he asks Jesus for a favor. In an amazing way, Jesus gives him a favor. 
And there's nothing he can promise. There's none of this. You know what? I'm going to be a good person from now on. I'm going to give to the church. I'm going to pray for my one. I'm going to sponsor a compassion child. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to do Bible study. There's none of that. He can't say, I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. He doesn't have much life left. But some of us actually, again, you're a believer. You know Christ. You know Christ. I know Christ. But so often we forget it. We forget it. The hymn says we are prone to wander. That's why the Bible, God calls it sheep. That is not a compliment. That's not a compliment. We're sheep. We're dumb. We just like go off to whatever's the latest thing, thinking that grass is greener. And loved one, the reason you and I have to know this, the reason you have to drill down that on that cross, Jesus died for me, that when you and I wander, when you wander, even as a believer, if you're not careful, if you're not careful, if you don't preach the gospel to yourself, you will be disappointed in yourself. You will think you disappointed God. And so you won't run back to God in repentance. You will run from God in shame. And one of the things I've learned is this, that when, I, when I'm not as far down the road as I want to be, anybody there with me? I mean, has anybody like been a Christian for a while? And sometime you're like, man, I am not, I thought by now that wouldn't even be an issue in my life. Any, anybody? Look at this. I mean, I tell you what, man, this is the honest crowd. All right, the honest crowd. First service looked at me like, I, I, Pastor, I have no idea what you would think about. And I was like, no, no, really? No, we, we did disappoint it, but here's the deal. The Bible calls us to repent and confess as believers, but for a long time, all I thought about of confession is just agreeing with God. Like, yeah, I blew it again. I had the wrong attitude again. I used the wrong words again. But what I've learned to do, otherwise I sit and I stew in it and I live in defeat, is I not just confess my sin, I confess the blood of Jesus and what he's done. And so I confess, God, I agree with you. That's not right. That's not who I am. That's not, you bought me with a price. That's not the way your son's supposed to act. But God, I also know that I have an advocate and you have paid for my sin. And so I come running back knowing that I didn't surprise you or shock you or make you do anything that could love me any less. So what you gotta do is, uh, how long does it take you when you fall to confess? How long does it take you when you do the same dumb thing again to run back to God. That's how well you know the gospel. When you know the gospel, you run back to God quickly. It's like, oh, oops, uh, I got to hide from my father. Or it's like, you know what? I sinned again. I got to run back to my father. So that's the, that's the cross of Christ. And the reason you got to do it, you got to get to number two. Number two, it says, uh, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? This is trash talk, folks. Are you not the Christ? You're not the guy everybody's talking about? Save yourself and us. Now listen, this is not surrendering to the lordship of Christ. He's re- Are you not the Christ? He doesn't want Jesus. He just wants something from Jesus. Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, the other thief. Now, this is where it starts to change. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? Since you were under the same sentence of condemnation, this brother understands the book of Romans before the book of Romans is even written. This guy like understands the wages of sin is death before the wages of sin is death is even written. He says, we're under a, the same sentence of condemnation for we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong, man. So you got the cross of Christ and pretty soon we're gonna get to the cross of covenant, which is a promise God makes this guy but before you get there, you get, let's spend a little bit of time on number two guy, and this is the cross of condemnation. That's what the guy's saying. He's like, we're condemned, and the reason we're condemned is because we deserve to be condemned. We deserve to be condemned. This guy's like, you did wrong, I did wrong, we deserve to be condemned. Now, by the way, you might be reading those other gospels when you said Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. We've said this before. These four gospels are sort of like, they'll oftentimes have the same episode but have a different angle on it. And think about it this way. When you watch, uh, if you watch the highlights, let's say of college football or the British Open that's going on, you might watch ESPN, you might watch uh, Fox Sports and you might watch the, the, local, the local sports. They all might have highlights of the British Open, but they might show different highlights of the same event. That's kind of what Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the way God uses them. But Matthew tells us that at the start, this other guy, the thief number two, he actually rails against Jesus as well. But somewhere in here, the scales fall off and this guy begins to look and it's like, man, this guy hadn't done anything wrong. Now we don't know much about him. We don't know if he watched the kangaroo court and the 
The way Jesus was treated, we don't know if he was in the crowd when Jesus was teaching, but somewhere in there, God began to do a work in his heart. And he's like, listen, we have been, we, we're up here for a reason. That guy didn't do anything wrong. And by the way, this one thief, he's making the same mistake. He's making the same mistake Peter made a few weeks ago when he makes the greatest profession of faith, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And like three verses later, you know, the Pope, the Pope goes, you know what? I don't want you going to the cross. And that's when Jesus says, you know what? Get behind me, Satan. It's what you and I do when we like the Jesus that I, the Jesus that I know would never. And we say something that's clearly already in the scriptures. So what happens is this conversation goes on and he looks at it and it's like, this is a picture of humanity. So let me take a second here. Everybody, when I say everybody, everybody, everybody knows something's wrong, right? Every nobody knows something's broken. It could be Rachel Maddow on MSNBC. It could be CNN. It could be Fox News. It could be the atheist. It could be the Muslim. It could be the Christian. Nobody is looking out on our world right now and go, man, we are killing it. I mean, we are, we are killing it. We're, we're doing an awesome job. We're batting it out. Nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing that. Everybody looks out and says, something is broken. Something's broken. Now, what the Bible teaches us is that's called sin. But here's what I want you to see. Every other worldview, every other religion, when they look out at a broken world, what they say is the answer to that is some kind of formula. Now, that formula, if you don't believe in God, is usually like self-help. I'm just going to be the best me I can be. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is not helping you become the best guy you can be or your best life now. That's not what the Bible's talking about. But every religion is the same way. Every other religion but the gospel teaches a formula in which man reaches back up to God. The gospel is God reaching down to man. And so now the formula changes. Some of them are like align your chakra or obey the five pillars or go to Mecca or be a good person or whatever that is. But bottom line, what the gospel says is, listen, good people don't go to heaven Good people do not go to heaven. Good people go to hell. You understand that? Good people go to hell. You're like, how are you saying that? Because the Bible teaches there are no good people. There was actually one good person and we put him on a cross. So good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. That's what the whole Christ, Christ, cross of Christ is about. So here's what, uh, here's what the Bible basically says. Bible says everybody's bad except one. Jesus is good. And so you and I have two, you, you don't have a choice. The Bible talks about uh, the wages of sin is death. The, even the guy on the thief on the cross, like, listen, we're up here because we earned it. And the Bible actually says that. We're going to earn it. And so the Bible teaches one of two ways. The Bible teaches either the payment's going to be made by you or the payment's going to be made by Jesus, one or the other. Right? It's either called self-atonement that you say, I got this. I do what I want, with who I want, whenever I want, however I want. I got this. That is self-atonement. And if you do that, you're going to stand before a holy God, and you are going to make an atonement. You're going to have to make a payment for your sin, and that's going to take all of eternity. Or you do what the Bible's whole message is about, and that's about substitutionary atonement, that I don't got this. I don't have this. I need somebody to do for me. I need somebody to do for me what I cannot do by myself. I, you're going to see what the third, the, the thief does here in a second, the third cross. I need you to give me a favor. I need you to do me a favor. When you say substitutionary atonement, it's like, I'm going to take what Jesus did in my place as that, as that payment. Now check out what this guy does. This guy does what many, many folks down through ages have done. Verse 42. And he said, it's one sentence. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Check that out. Think about how, think about this. This brother is in his last moments on planet earth. He is, from all we can tell, done nothing good, hurt people. And in his last moments on earth, he asks somebody else who's dying on a cross right next to him, he asks him for a favor. He says, Jesus Remember me. Now that's crazy. Somehow God has taken the scales off of his eyes and he's looking at the person dying next to him and it's like, you're a king. You're about to go into your kingdom. 
Somehow, some way, what you're doing is making payment for what I have done. And so, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He's asking God for a favor. If you've ever prayed to receive Jesus, you asked God for a favor. If you've ever surrendered to Christ, you've asked God for a favor. You're not asking what is owed. It's not like you're a boss and you're saying, hey, I need you to be on time tomorrow. That's what they owe you. They owe you to be on time. You're asking God for a favor. God, you don't owe me anything. I bring nothing to the table at all except my sin. I bring nothing but my sin. But God, would you do, would you do me a favor? And you know what? When you ask God for a favor with that posture, God answers that prayer 100% of the time. 100% of the time. With that posture, that posture, I mean, you all know how I love, I mean, I, I'm, I love me some country music. I got to watch it because I love it too much sometimes. But a lot of country music theology is not awesome. It's not awesome. I mean, sometimes it's awesome. Occasionally there's like a, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, like Garth Brooks, thank God for unanswered prayer, awesome theology. I mean, would most of us not say, man, there's some things I'm glad God didn't answer. I mean, thank God for that. But there's a song by Larry Fleet. Larry Fleet has this one song out, and man, there's this one phrase in there, and he's talking about he was sitting in a bar and just so down, he wasn't worth anything. There's this one phrase, I'm like, that's it, that's the, that's the thief. He said, because I didn't feel worth saving, but he saved me anyway. I love that. Somebody ought to go download that song, man, it's, it's good. I wasn't worth saving, but God saved me anyway. Or the way we put it kind of in a little tweetable deal is salvation is not achieved, it is received. It is not achieved. It's not something you do. It is something you receive as a gift. Again, the only thing you and I bring to the equation is the sin that makes it necessary. Now, I know some of you are like, man, that sounds like, sounds like, like for me, sounds like my stepdad growing up. Actually, it was, I was probably a late teen by the time he came into the equation. I was like a brand new believer. And I told him the gospel, he's like, there's no way it can be that easy. He grew up in a very much of a works-based righteousness. And he was, what he was rebelling against or repelling against either was pride or probably even more so, he'd seen Christians do what Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. Cheap grace is like, you know what, I'm going to pray this little prayer and nothing is going to happen at all. By the way, that is not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say cheap grace. The Bible talks about costly grace and that when you get run over by the grace train, everything changes. And if nothing has changed, then you haven't really received the grace. But when Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, what he says is this. He says, cheap grace is forgiveness without repentance, communion without confession, grace without the cross. And the reason we know this brother repented is because look what he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Somehow he's like, you're a king, you have a kingdom, you're in charge, would you remember me, would you be my king? That's called repentance, that's repent. Because some of you are like, are deathbed conversions real? Are deathbed conversions real? I mean, is it really real? Let's say some joker has like spent 50 years, nothing to do with God, blow it, just chasing whatever, and then he's up at Advent or he's up at Mission, and you go up and visit him, and like, I mean, like two days before he dies, he like gives his life to Christ. You're like, man, is that real? I mean, do those count? And it, yes, it counts. Yes, it counts. Yes, it is. Now, I'm not saying cheap grace. If all it was was a get out of hell free card, that's what I want, get out of hell free card. That's not repentance and faith. That's not what the Bible teaches. But if it's legitimate, like, God, I have spent my years, my 50 years blowing you off, and I now believe that what you did on that cross counted for me, and I give my life to you, and whether I got five minutes or five years or 50 years left, I want to spend my life serving you, then absolutely that is. Now, by the way, you got to ask yourself the question again, have you ever asked God for that favor? Have you ever asked God for that favor? Have you ever said, God, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? I mean, would you remember me? I need a favor. I need you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. Have you ever done that? Now, you don't have to do that at the end of the service. You don't even have to close your eyes right where you're seated, right where you're watching, with your eyes open. You can say, you know what, Jesus, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to do for me what I cannot do. Somehow, I believe that what you did on that cross counted for me. That was my sin. You were in my place. Would you please save me where I sit at church? That happened in the first service. I was meeting guys out at the lobby. He's like, that happened to me. In the first, that can happen to you as well. Have you ever asked God for a favor? If not, ask him right now. 
Ask him right now. God, just eyes open. God, would you do me a favor? As I turn to you and I turn my life to you. Because when you look at this story, there's only one other sentence left. And it's verse 43. And if, any God, if anybody makes it to heaven, this joker makes it to heaven. I mean, what did he say? It, this is a promise, a covenant. It's what, that's a covenant is like a turbo promise. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And, this, and then Jesus looks at him and he says, truly, truly is like, listen, it's gonna be hard to believe. You might miss this. Truly, I say to you today, you will be with me. With me is actually the emphasis. You'll be with me in paradise. So as surely as we know Jesus went to heaven, we know that this joker went to heaven as well. We know this guy, made, and this is the craziest thing. No promises, no, I'm gonna do this. Just surrender and a promise. Now, some of y'all for homework, there was a, probably like three years ago is when I first saw it, but man, there's a, there's a sermon clip you guys need to go look. Don't do it now, please. But there's a guy named Alistair Begg that's got a sermon called The Man on the Middle Cross. And he's catching a little grief in the last year or so. It, uh, I think if you disagree with somebody, you don't necessarily just cancel them just because you disagree. This brother's been a faithful brother for like 50 years. He's a Scottish preacher. And I mean, Scottish just sounds cool, right? I mean, it's like Australian singers sound cool and Scottish preachers sound cooler than Americans. This guy's like a Scottish, so I'm not gonna give you that Scottish brogue. I'm just gonna read a portion to you and you can go Google it at home, be blessed. So he's sitting there and he's preaching. I think it's at a Presbyterian uh, conference or something like that. And you'll know when you look at it behind him, it's like even they laugh because it's like, they look like the frozen chosen behind them, but it's like, man, they're even laughing. But so... Beg sits there and he goes through this and he's, he, he said, I'm, I used the Fort Lauderdale question. Fort Lauderdale is basically where evangelism explosion started and the way that they train people, and this is the way I got trained to share my faith. This is, this is the way I got trained to start the conversation, which I know it might sound a little odd to you, but it, I mean, it gets you right to the point. Uh, and it's, the question is this, is if you were to die tonight and you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I mean, I know it might freak you out if somebody came up to you and it's like, if you were to die tonight, you're like, is it about to happen? I don't know, but either way, either way, it gets you right to the point. And so he says, if you could ask that Fort Lauderdale question or if you could ask that EE question, if you were to die tonight and you were to go into heaven and they were to say, why should I let you know my heaven? What would you say? And he's like, listen, if you answer in the first person something that you did, he's like, you're off base already. He says, we answer in the third person. He did this and he did that. And here's what he says. He goes, think about the thief on the cross. He's like, what a mince. I don't even know what a mince is. All right, Scottish deal. It's like, what a mince. He says, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, to ask him. He goes, how did that shake out for you? Because he goes, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You've never been in a Bible study, never got baptized. You didn't know a thing about church membership. And he says, and yet, he says, he says and, and, you, and you made it. He made it. He's like, how did you make it? He says he's going to go up there, and he said the angel must have said, uh, what are you doing here? Now, by the way, this is a little bit of a liberty that Beg takes because there's no indication you got to answer like three quiz questions from an angel when you get to heaven, but the angel must have said, what are you doing here? He's like, I don't know. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, because I don't know. He says, well, he's like, it flusters the angel. He's like, excuse me, i got to go with my angel supervisor. And the angel supervisor comes up here. And he says, I, uh, uh, a couple of questions for you. First of all, he says, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? He's like, never heard of it. Are you clear on the doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture? He's like, he's just kind of staring at him and just frustration. And he kind of goes on and on. And what about the, what about the doctrine of this? And what about, he's like, I don't even have any idea what you're talking about. And the whole key there is he's like, he's like, by what basis, by what basis are you here? And the guy's like, the man on the middle cross said I could come. Have you heard, have you heard the man on the middle cross look at you and say today, 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 or whatever day it is you pass, today you will be with me in paradise. This is why, by the way, folks, even as a believer, you gotta preach the gospel to yourself in every single day. 
That's why a lot of times Christians struggle with this whole eternal insecurity. They're like, you know what? Am I, am I saved? Can I, if I'm saved, am I going to lose my salvation if I mess up? Now, listen to me. I understand that question. People are basically like, once saved, always saved. Or if you're saved, can you lose your salvation? Well, actually, in the fall, study the book of James, and that'll reinforce, actually, from a different perspective. No, you can't. The Bible, the Bible says that, actually, once you are saved, you cannot lose your salvation. But it's actually the wrong question. The question is not... Once you're saved, can you lose your salvation? The question is, can God ever lose one of his children? That's the question. Can God ever lose one of his kids? And the answer to that is absolutely not. He cannot. Now, some of you are like, what about I know Jerry or I knew Sam and he prayed a prayer, even a prayer in your church, and then nothing changed. Let me say it again. I'm not saying praying a little prayer or raising a hand or filling out a card or even getting baptized. None of that stuff tells you in the Bible that if you're, that you're in Christ. I'm saying that once you're in Christ, if the grace train has run you over and you've had, you've, it's visible, this has changed you, not perfection, but direction, then no, you cannot, you cannot, you can't lose that. Man, I remember, uh, I think, I've, I mean, this is to my shame, up until like the last two years, maybe the last three years, I bet you, you could count on one hand the times that I've cried. And I, that's not a brag, that's actually bad. I mean, if you're that hardened or if you're that callous or insecure or whatever it is, but, you know, as you get a little older, you start to get a little more sensitive. But I will say this, one of the times before the last couple of years that I wept that I can remember were not really tears of sadness, but there was, if it gets in your soul, something kicks on, you can't really hold back. And I remember distinctly being on the balcony of the dorm at the seminary where I started. So I started at seminary. You all know, I'd only been a Christian like four years at that point. I was being around all these guys that got saved at like, you know, in diapers and they were like called to ministry when they were like 10. You know, I came to Christ as a late teen and then got called later. But I remember being up on that and I'd, I'd been saved enough where I'd started listening to like contemporary Christian and all this kind of and Stephen Curtis Chapman and man, God bless him. God bless him. But for the first time, I was sitting on this balcony up at, up at the seminary in Texas and it was summertime, so not a bunch of people were there, and I had the room to myself for moving into a house. And I, and I listened to a song for the first time that I'll bet you this week I listened to 40 times. And in the song, it's actually a hymn called There Is a Fountain. And man, it's like there is, a, I wish I could sing, man. I wish I could sing. I'm not ever going to sing a song except Zacchaeus to you, ever. But um, it's, it's this song that's like there, there is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. And I was listening to that song and it was like getting on me. And then the next one, I thought about all week long because the second stanza, second stanza says the dying thief, he's talking about what we're looking at today, the dying thief rejoiced, I just thought about that. I mean, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and then it goes, and there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. I mean, do you know that? Yeah, you were just like that criminal. You're like, I'm a good guy. Who are you compared to who? Compared to who? The nightly news? I mean, compared to who? All right, your, your high school teammate? No. The Bible actually says, God says, be holy as I am holy. Anybody rocking that one with an A plus average? Nobody. You're like, I am, I am. No, you're a liar and you're prideful, which is like the granddaddy of sin. So you're like the worst of the worst. But what you gotta understand is that's who Jesus died for. And this thief is finally realizing that. The question is, have you realized that? So here's, there's so many things even for the believers we close. But think about this. Not only just is, it's, it's eternal security, it means you're not who your feelings say you are. I mean, feelings right now, what is, feelings are like the king of our culture. Well, I feel a certain way, or I feel, and maybe you feel condemned, but if you're in Christ, the Bible says you're not condemned. Feelings are not your king anymore. Jesus is your king. So that's why we always say, you're not who, you're not who people say you are. This brother's not who his past said he is. You're not who your abortion says you were, your divorce says you are, who everybody else says you are. You are who God says you are. Why? Because this is what Jesus did for you. And you look at, uh, now some people, the last thing, some people will say, well, man, that's all you got to do is just like get the grace and then just like rock on with normal life. That's, 
The Bible, I heard this quote about a year ago, and I, I can't, if you know who said it, tell me, because I can't find who said it, but it stuck with me. And it's like, the gospel is not, not anti-effort. It's anti-earning. The Bible is not anti, the gospel is not anti-effort. All the epistles, those letters after the gospels, they have a ton of effort. It's like, listen, love God, forgive people, love people, be generous over and over, serve people. There's a lot of effort in there but it's not earning. You're not doing it to say, look at all the stuff I've done, God, so you'll love me. You realize, listen, Jesus loved me. He died on a cross for me. And so I'm gonna spend the rest of my life serving him out of gratitude for what he did. It's a big difference. So um, here's the way we're gonna end. And let me say this. Uh, don't tell the people in the first service. You all sang a lot better than nine o'clock today. You really did. You just sang a lot better. But I'm gonna give you one more chance. If you came to both... I don't know what to tell you. Um, people lifted you up. So the way, we, the way we talk about it here is about our response time. It's like most pieces, people are like, sermon's over, let's leave. You got about four or five minutes left and it's not to leave. It, it, we talk about come sing, bring, and you actually have go. So come means you come to the altar. If you've got a burden on your heart, you need to give it over to God. The Bible says, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Some of you got a burden that's so heavy and you don't need to walk out of here with that. Get, come up here, give that burden to the Lord and leave it up here. Some of you got some correction that needs to be done. You're a Christ follower, but she's like, man, I'm not following Christ right now. I'm like way out in the distant country. You come up here and you get some grace. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will pour out his grace on you. You're like I could use some grace. Well, humble yourself. Whether it's a concern, a burden, maybe you've got your one that you really love, but they're showing no interest and it's breaking your heart and you want to give up and stop praying. Well, I've been there. Come up here and pray for your one. Just like, God, would you show me that, you know what, if I sow in tears, if I sow in tears, like the psalmist says, if I sow in tears, there will be a day when I reap with joy. Some of you just will be singing. It's a great song. It's called Clean. And it's not a big song where you like ramp it up and but it is a song I'm asking you to sing with some intensity and some intentionality. It's soft, but it's intentional. So sing it with gratitude. Others of you need to like, man, I'm gonna be a part of the gospel mission. You bring your tithe and offering. And then fourthly, what we don't do all the time is this is the time, you got like three or four minutes. If you've not written your one on the wall, write their first name only. If you've seen your one come to Christ, go up there and get that red pen and just for the glory of God, the edification of the saints, circle that thing and then you can go back to your seat, okay? Why don't you stand with me? Stand up where you are. Let me pray for us, and then we're gonna respond. Father, thanks for these folks. I love them like crazy. We love what you're doing in the life of our church, your church. Gotta pray these next three or four minutes for the glory of God, that burdens would be given over, correction would be accepted, intercession would be made for the people we love, that you would give us perseverance to continue to pray, to sow in tears so that we can reap in joy. God, we, we do pray. We pray that as we enter into this, we pray for student camp, pray for what you're gonna do next week down in Anderson, South Carolina, that you would do what you always do, that you would call students to ministry, that you would call them to salvation, that you would call them to repentance, that you'd call them back to joy. God, we love you. We pray for these next three or four minutes, whether we're praying, singing, writing, whatever it is we're doing, that will be done for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.